Hello. On behalf of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota, welcome to the 2023 OLLI Sampler. My name is Kate Schaefers, and I'm Director of OLLI at the University of Minnesota. Welcome today. I'd like to start with our university's land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose lands we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. So before we start, let me share a bit about Ali. Ali is the place to learn, grow, and connect for lifelong learners age 50 and above. With hundreds of enrichment courses a year, plus special interest groups and book clubs, Ali helps you explore your interests, stay informed, and open your mind to new ideas, cultures, and learning. If you're a current Ali member, thank you for your continued support and participation. And if you're new to Ali, welcome. We look forward to getting to know you. So let's get started. It is my pleasure today to introduce Ali's advisory board chair, Nancy Allen. In addition to her role as chair of the advisory board, Nancy has been an active Ali member since 2014. Nancy frequently volunteers as a course assistant and other roles in addition to her role on advisory board chair. Um, and she's also been an Ali ambassador. And so please join me in welcoming Nancy Allen. There okay. I am. How do we see you? Perfect. There I am. Hello. Good morning, everybody. And as luck would have it, the second I started to talk, the lawn mowers and everything else outside is going. But anyway, um, hope you can hear me. I'm sitting here looking at my picture. Um, so nice to have so many of you. And as Kate said, I am an active member of Ollie, and I'm so happy to be one. I uh, became chair of the board like two days after the pandemic started and we got into a new form of Ollie, but I've been happy to be here ever since. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I joined Ali in 2014 and I've been a member ever since. And as Kate said, I have been a member and I've been a volunteer and I've been a course instructor, I mean, uh, assistant and uh, been involved in the classes and so happy to have met many, many, many of you. And I look forward to even meeting all you new potential members. So um, let's just start with a, a couple of um, slides that I would like to start with. So Grayson, if you could start the first one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, as you can see, Ali is a dynamic and engaging and ever-growing um, organization. Uh, we're member-based and we uh, organize around uh, our members and our volunteers. Uh, many of our classes are held in the community. Some are held on the St. Paul campus. We are continuously always looking for more places to hold our in-person classes. But as you can imagine, many, many, many of our classes are online and will continue to be online. Um, and um, as uh, mentioned before, I have been a volunteer and I'm on the advisory board and I continue, I hope to continue to be on the advisory board for several more years, maybe not as a capacity as chair, but um, on the board. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so the University of Minnesota is obviously a worldwide well-known university, and we are part of the College of Continuing Professional Studies. Our offices are physically on the St. Paul campus, but of course, most of our staff and most everybody is working online, so we're kind of all over the place. And the College of Continuing and Professional Studies is uh, a place where education is, enriches life and at every stage. And we, our OLLI here in Minnesota is part of 125 other OLLIs across the United States. And I would say most all of them are associated with uh, a college or a university. And we are the only OLLI in the state of Minnesota. 
Um, the heart of Ollie is, of course, all our magnificent non-credit courses. Here's just a sample of some of the classes that we're offering this fall. Um, feel free to ask for one of our catalogs. I'm sure it can be sent to you or it is online. And of course, the fun thing about Ollie is just the continuous learning that we have with no tests, no papers. It's just the joy of learning. And of course, it is interactive. So you can communicate with, you know, the, your instructor and with other students in the class, students, you know, participants. Yeah. So next slide, please. And of course, the basis of Ali is our community. And we welcome you to, to join us as part of our community. And we're dedicated to an active law, uh, lifelong learning. This is one of the joys that we have that our members just love to learn and um, with a variety of classes. And we have many opportunities for social engagements. And um, we serve a purposeful aging um, commitment that you continuously learn. And it's part of the joy of our second half of life. And uh, we have many, many, many um, years yet to go. And so we have lots to learn and we wanna make it fun learning. Um, next slide. So we offer classes on Zoom. We also offer training. So uh, we train for our members, for our course leaders, course assistants, and our SIG leaders. And so do not ever feel intimidated by joining us via Zoom because we have people who can help you and to train you. And it's a great way. It's just a great way for all of us to communicate and to be together. Um, you don't have to show your face. If you don't want to, you can put yourself on, on mute or you don't have to show your face. But um, it's, um, it, it's, it's just a way that we can all participate from all over the state, wherever you are, if you're up at your cabin up north or someplace. Um, a SIG leader is, those are the, um, the groups that we have that are more on an informal basis and we meet um, in various places in parks or in community centers. And th they are um, groups that such as, you know, Scrabble or there's a knitting group or there's a walking group. And the leaders are people, are volunteers who volunteer their time to run these SIG classes or just uh, SIG groups more. Okay, next slide. Join a SIG, start a SIG. These are special interest groups, as I said. And they are a group of people who just love to get together on a weekly basis or maybe once a month. Uh, we have a, a board member who is a, kind of in charge of the SIGs. And as I say, one of them is um, a Scrabble group that gets together. Um, it's a social way of getting together in person and you meet regularly. There's dozens of themes. There's anything from jazz appreciation to memoir, uh, writing, storytelling. There's book clubs, chamber orchestras, number of books clubs and just so many things. Um, the Scrabble group that meets on Mondays is a great, great way to for people to meet. Um, so next slide, please. So we also have a lot of volunteer opportunities. Uh, you can lead a course, you can become a course assistant. You can even decide to form your own uh, SIG group. You just get a group of members and start it. Uh, you can serve on the advisory board. You can help host an event, volunteers for a standing committee. There's lots of opportunity, but you also will get a lot of help from the board and from other members. So don't feel that you're gonna be, you have to just start this all on your own. We're here to help you. And um, Let's see, social events. We also do a lot of social events, not as many as we used to because of the COVID, but we're trying to get back into it. We have membership events. We have online social other, uh, hour gatherings. Uh, we're going to be meeting in the parks this coming fall. We have course leader gatherings, special celebration picnics, 
And we're just trying to get out more and more. We're trying to get ourselves out from under this whole COVID situation. So please join us for any of our outdoor events. And they're well advertised. And we hope to see many of you there. And now, uh, thank you for your time. And I'm going to pass this over back now to Laura Peterson. Who yeah, is a volunteer. And let me introduce Laura. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was a wonderful overview of some of the things we do. And let me introduce Laura Peterson. Um, Laura first joined Ali during the pandemic in 2020, and she's been an active learner and volunteer since. And she's going to tell you a little bit about her experience as an Ali member. Laura, let me hand it over to you. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everybody. I really will only take a few minutes of your time so you can get on to these wonderful sampler classes. I just wanted to say, I suspect you're here today because you're like me and you enjoy learning. Um, my love of learning goes way back. I majored in Chinese history in college. And then because there was nothing to do with that degree, um, I went on to nursing school and then I went on to law school. So it is fair to say that I love school, but Ali is an incredibly special place. Um, so the demands of a career, obviously, and raising a family took precedence during my middle years. Um, but my interest in learning basically everything didn't go away. So when I retired, which was in February of 2020, right before the pandemic hit, I searched for something that would give me connection and would let me continue to learn. And a friend of mine, Lonnie Scrantner, who is a retired history teacher, and she regularly teaches for Ali, mentioned Ali to me. So I checked it out, and let me tell you, there was no turning back. I started in the fall of 2020. I took four classes nestled into my hammock with my laptop and enjoyed. Uh, I took classes on the politics of poverty, the Supreme Court, police killings, Jane Eyre and I could not get enough. So in the winter of 2020, perhaps unfortunately, I registered for 13 Ali classes at once. And that was a bit much, I will tell you, but, but it was still fascinating. Um, the structure and the joy uh, of these classes sustained me truly through the pandemic. So that winter I took classes on art at our local art institute, weapons of mass destruction, insects, where we had real insects in the class, Chinese history, of course, um, immunology, the food stamp program, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, Africa, India, TED Talks, Charles Dickens, and more. Although classes were offered through Zoom at that time, Ali, of course, as Nancy mentioned, now offers classes both in person and via Zoom. So you can pick the format you're most comfortable with. There's also, as Nancy mentioned, lots of opportunities to get involved, which I have availed myself of. You can be the course assistant, you can um, join committees, there's all kinds of things to do, none of which are scary. So don't be intimidated by any of that. If you, once you start taking classes and you realize what a wonderful program this is and how great the people are, I think you'll find you, you want to try to give back a little bit. So there's lots of opportunities, but of course you don't have to be involved at all. You can just sit back and enjoy and meet wonderful, interesting people. Um, as Nancy mentioned as well, no homework, no tests, so easy and enjoyable. I can truly say that my life today would not be as interesting without Ali. And I cannot wait to get the catalog of classes each quarter. There are literally hundreds of classes each year and you will not find a better deal anywhere. Uh, I think you'll find that Ali members live the saying, curiosity never retires. There are people just like you, interested in learning, interested in meeting people, and interested in growing. So check out our fall 2023 catalog, consider joining, and please enjoy the rest of today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that firsthand experience with Ali. 
I'm now excited to introduce you to our four instructors who will offer brief lectures based on the courses they'll be teaching for us this year. I'll introduce all, all of them right now and then we'll dive into the lectures. So our first lecture today is an example of a course that combines current affairs with historical con context. Henry Berman will speak on the roots of conflict in the Middle East. Henry is a sought after speaker on global affairs topics through Global Minnesota's Great Decisions series. He's also a frequent and popular course instructor for Ali. And this fall, Henry will be teaching a course, The Legacy of the Arab Spring. Some of our Ali courses explore arts and culture. Our second presentation, The Power of Place, focuses on the connections we have with the spaces around us, drawing on works of art. Our two presenters, Kay Miller and Emily Shapiro, are both docents at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And a little bit about Kay, in addition to her work with the Minneapolis Institute of Art, she also had a career in journalism. And Emily had a career as an attorney in addition to now leading museum tours. And Kay and Emily are gonna teach a course this fall called The Power of Place, Ali at MIA. And then our third lecture is going to feature one of our Ali scholars. And some of our courses focus on early career scholars through our Ali Scholars Program. Through this program, graduate students and postdocs share their fascinating, cutting edge work with the Ali community. And our Ali scholars are incredibly popular with our members. Um, They're also partially supported by donations from our members, and we're very grateful for that. In today's sampler, we're gonna hear from Ali scholar, Emily Schoenbeck. Emily is finishing up a PhD in English literature where she specializes in drama and film adaptation. She's taught several Shakespeare related courses for Ali and her talk today will be Romeo and Juliet, Love and Family. Next winter, Emily is going to be teaching an Ali course, Everybody But Shakespeare. So welcome to all of our speakers. We're gonna start with Henry. So Henry, welcome. Grayson, if I get the first slide. <clears throat> The Roots of Middle East Conflict. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all of you for participating this morning. Why is it that in such a small part of the world, there is so much violent conflict on a regular basis? Since the beginning of this century, which is not that long ago, there have been four violent uh, civil wars in Libya, Yemen, Iraq and Syria that have taken a tremendous toll on the inhabitants of that region. <clears throat> Why does this take place? Just to give you an example of the depth of this type of violence, in Syria, as an example, there have been, uh, the, the, uh, the civil war started in 2011. And in 2010, the year prior to that, there was a population of 23 to 24 million people. Since that time, in that context, there have been over half a million people have died. Over one half of all the population have been forced, over one half have been forced to leave their homes, either to leave the country or go elsewhere in the country. And most horrifying of all to me is in 2010, the average longevity in Syria was 79 years of age. And four years later, the average was 55 years of age. So with that, Grayson, can we move on to the next slide, please? What I'd like to first start out with is an understanding of what is the Middle East. The Middle East has a different meaning to everybody, what the context is. So I thought I would share with you with a map what the Middle East uh, uh, entails for me. Uh, the Middle East consists of 17 countries. The only country that's not on this map is Tunisia. Uh, the other two in Africa are Libya and Egypt. Saudi Arabia, going into the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, the six Gulf states, which include Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Yemen. And then finishing it out are Iran and Iraq. Jordan and Israel, Syria and Lebanon, and last but not least, Turkey. These are the um, 17 countries that constitute the Middle East. And I always like to start all of my lectures 
with a take on geography to give people a sense of place where in the world these uh, countries are situated. If you could turn uh, uh, to the next slide, please, Grayson. I'm gonna spend the entire time within the context of this slide. And I will say before I even get started, one aspect of regional conflict uh, in terms of the roots that I did not include here are great power uh, rivalries. Uh, United States, China, Russia, by and large, they have not been parts of the roots of regional conflict, although they tend to get involved at some point. And most often than not, they make a situation worse rather than better. But I will not be talking about those great powers in that context today. What we have here in this region are centuries old uh, hatreds and bigotries that go back literally, in many cases, 1,500 years. <clears throat> the first, there are all sorts of intertwining threads here that take place and lots of complexities. And I'm just gonna talk to this at a very, very high level for the sake of time involved. We have to start with religion. Everything starts with the religion in the Middle East. Now, many people have suggested it seems intuitive because 98% of all the population in the Middle East are Muslim, followers of Islam, instinctively, you might think, well, that should mean that the region would be a region or area of harmony and peace. Not so at all. In the context of religion, in the context of Islam itself, there is a centuries long struggle between the Shias and the Sunnis. The Shias, and the Sunnis, this conflict started the generation after Muhammad, literally around 800. And the Shias believed that the, um, that the followers, the next generation, the succession of leaders should be lineage based, similar to what we have in Britain now. And the Sunnis felt that it should be merit based. And they argued and argued, and then they eventually split. Now, 85% of all Muslims globally are Sunni, 15% are Shia, and all Shia Muslims are located in the Middle East. The countries where a majority of Shia Muslims live include Iran, Iraq, and Bahrain. And they're also uh, about 30, 40% Shia Muslims in Lebanon as well. So uh, this is a major um, issue. And in terms of religion, there are several other kind of strands of religion that cause conflict. A secular approach is another of Arab nationalists, Arab nationalist leaders versus a more uh, spiritual uh, institutions. That type of a uh, conflict surfaced primarily in Egypt where the military have ruled Egypt for the last 70 years. And the uh, spiritual enterprise is called the Muslim Brotherhood. And there have been very, very hostile uh, conflicts between the two on again, off and on again. And that continues to this day. Also in the context of religion, there are uh, some small pockets of, uh, of Christianity. The most notable is actually in Lebanon where there is a sect called the Maronites. And uh, in Lebanon, you have about 30 to 40% Christian population and 30% Sunni and about 30% Shia. And as you can well imagine, this is bound to generate a great deal of conflict as it has over the past many decades. I'm gonna switch here to ethnicity. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot a very, very important aspect of religion in the Middle East. And that is in 1948, the state of Israel, a Jewish state was established and the rest of the Arab world in the region went bonkers. And there, were, there was violent conflict, there were invasions uh, the day after independence took place. And there has been conflict with Israel and many of their neighboring states on and off ever since 1948. So you can see the religion feeds into a great deal of conflict. Now, I wanna say, I believe that the Shia 
um, Sunni conflict is a little bit um, is a little bit overstated by the press, and it is uh, instinctively the peoples do not uh, fight that frequently, but the issue has been taken advantage of by authoritarian leaders and manipulated in a way to stoke lots and lots of hatreds and violence over the years. I think that that aspect of this overall picture that I'm gonna present here is a little bit overplayed by the press. Ethnicity, on the other hand, is another story and it's a different kind of a nuance to it. There are four primary ethnicities in the Middle East. They are Arab. Um, the second one is Persian. The third is Turks, are Turks. And the fourth are the Kurds. Now, the, to start with the first two, the Arabs and the Persians, they have been arguing and fighting in a violent fashion for the last seven, 800 years. And to this day, there appears to be tremendous number of ethnic hatreds, particularly between the Persians and the Arabs. And those are manifested today with the Persians being primarily in Iran and Arabs reflected in Saudi Arabia. So this is a, a, a very large cause of conflict. One point about the Arabs, which I think is a tremendous misnomer, and that is that many people believe that 100% of Muslims in the world are Arab, are ethnic Arab, and that's not the case. Only 18% are ethnic Arab. There are hundreds of millions of Muslims in Asia, totally outside of the region, in places like Indonesia, Pakistan, India. Um, another thing about the ethnicity, we talked about there's a little, there's a tremendous hatred between Saudi Arabia, I'm sorry, between the Persians and the Arabs. Um, another one that is prevalent, has been very, very dominant the last few decades, is between the Turks and the Kurds. Turks are obviously primarily uh, reside in the current country of Turkey. The Kurds are in a very interesting story. The Kurds are the largest ethnic population in the world that uh, they're 40 million globally that do not have their own country. They do not have their own country. 90% of the Kurds globally live in four countries, sections of four countries. Turkey to the east represents, Kurds represent 20% of that population. Um, Syria uh, uh, in the northeast, uh, Iraq in the northern part of Iraq, and in the northern, northeast part of Iran as well. In those four areas, uh, there is a term called Kurdistan. Kurdistan is not a real country. It is just the fictitious combination of those four areas where the Kurdish people predominate. The Kurds are primarily Sunni, and the Turks are primarily Sunni as, as well. But they do have their own culture, uh, their own cuisine, uh, and the like. There's actually, I will tell you, there's a great Kurdish restaurant in downtown St. Paul called Babani's. Um, I urge you to, to go there. I believe it's still open. I was there a couple of years ago. Um, so there's a real thriving culture with the Kurds and they go back many, many uh, centuries. They primarily live in the mountains. And because so many of them are living in Turkey, there have over the years, in 1984, there was established a separatist movement among the Kurds called the PKK, which is the Kurdistan Workers Party, which has been engaged in violent conflict with Turkey uh, since 1984. Um, and this conflict has spilled over just in the last decade into Syria because of the Syrian Kurds and their fight against ISIS and their relationship also with, uh, with the uh, PKK. And right now, as we speak, the Syrian, uh, part of Syria, very far up in the north, is being controlled by the Turks. And uh, there is continued violence as a result of that. So these ethnic problems really continue are very, very, uh, uh, very, very problematic. And they are truly hatreds that go back many, many years. I'm gonna give you two short anecdotes of commentaries that were given to me personally that engage in some, um, some ethnic slurs, let's say. One time I was giving a talk 
at, uh, it was on the Iran nuclear deal about seven years ago. And a gentleman raised his hand and got up and said, I gave a comment in support of the Iran nuclear deal. He challenged me and said, don't you realize you just can't trust those Arabs? Well, on top of the fact that um, I told him that I took issue with saying that uh, hundreds of millions of Arabs globally cannot be trusted. That seemed like a broad generalization and I challenged that. The other point that was made was that Iranians are not Arabs, Iranians are Persians. And uh, these type of confusions take place all the time. Um, another anecdote, which I found interesting, I was in, having a conversation on a kibbutz with a member of the kibbutz in Israel. And we were talking about the George Floyd situation and how horrible racism is in the, uh, in the United States and continues to be a major problem in American society. And he bought into that and believed it sincerely. And then in the same breath soon thereafter, he commented to me that um, he doesn't like going into the Arab villages in Israel because after all, as you know, most Arabs are just dirty. Well, I just couldn't believe in my own mind the hypocrisy of a comment like that, given his statements about racism. And yet these type of ethnic overviews and summaries and, and falsehoods, which represent uh, a kind of a bigotry or prejudices are throughout the Middle East, everywhere. You hear these things constantly. And there was a rapprochement in May 10th between that China brokered between the uh, 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 Iran and Saudi Arabia. And some of the commentaries about it question whether it'll last long. And a common statement I heard is because as we know, Arabs and Persians just don't like each other and never have. So you hear that a lot. And this kind of ethnic challenge uh, takes place all the time. Let's move on to colonialism. Colonialism is a major problem in as a root of regional conflict, going back primarily to World War I and a pact that was called Sykes-Pico. Sykes-Pico, Sykes Pico were the names of uh, um, were the names of two diplomats, and these diplomats uh, orchestrated a pact in secret after the British had promised they had promised to have a uh, 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 the Arabs that they would give them independence if they joined in the fight against Turkey. They nonetheless engaged in conflict, uh, engaged in a uh, uh, an agreement to divide up the Middle East. And uh, this was done on paper. It took no account of, of ethnic breakdowns, religious breakdowns, it just, clear, just divided up based on their own greed and hubris. As a result of that, four phony nations were created. Uh, these were nations that were just created by the English and French. And those were Jordan, Syria, uh, Iraq, and, and Lebanon. And Interestingly, three out of those four have been riddled with conflict. And I truly blame a lot of that on the hubris of Great Britain and France going back 100, 120 years. Next step, if you were to do a one, um, a one word association with the Middle East, most likely what people would say terrorism or oil. Notice I haven't mentioned them yet. The only thing I wanna comment about terrorism is this. The terror groups, there are many, many, not just Al-Qaeda or ISIS. There's Hamas, Hezbollah, the PKK, uh, groups along those lines uh, in Libya, in Iran. Uh, they do not, uh, they fight amongst each other. And in many ways, that just makes the conflict even worse. As far as oil is concerned, uh, all I will say about oil is I believe that oil has been a curse, not a blessing uh, to those uh, countries like Saudi Arabia. And it has created an environment of complacency and an environment that uh, obstructs real capitalist economic growth. And someday, someday, you mark my words, they're going to run out of oil. Uh, I don't know when that's going to be. I'd say if you were pressed, if I were pressed somewhere between 30 and 70 years from now, they're going to be, they're going to run out of oil and, uh, and they're going to be in a world of hurt, these countries, and they're not getting ready for it. So that's a big problem. The last root of conflict is the fragility of just generally generic developing nations. And you have specifically the demographics and particularly in the Middle East, you've got huge demographic bulges. 
And I'm going to give you an example. In the country of Iran, 60% of the country are, uh, are under the age of 30 years old, 60% of the country, 40% between ages of 18 and 30. So this is a big problem. The other primary factors are, include corruption and horrific, horrific income inequality. So in conclusion, uh, all of these roots here of conflict are things that have been sustaining tragically for many, many years. And there's not, there are not a lot of signs of them ending anytime soon. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, I, I am done and thank you very much, Kate. Henry, thank you so much, that was fascinating. Our next lecture will be led by the amazing team of Kay Miller and Emily Shapiro. Welcome Kay and Emily. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, and uh, thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, Kay and I are excited to uh, give a taste, as it were, of our upcoming fall uh, class at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which we are calling the Power of Place, Art at Mia. Now, this course uh, has been offered as part of the OLLI curriculum under different names and with different course leaders uh, every year since OLLI began in 1995. And Kay and I are uh, proud to be um, among its current course leaders, but hopefully we will by no means uh, be the last ones and that this course will continue uh, into the future. Um, next slide, please. Here we uh, is a, just a little glimpse of the museum where our fall course will be held. We have offered it in Zoom format as well and plan to do so again, uh, at least in part in the winter. Next slide, please. So um, just a brief overview of this fall class. Uh, we now uh, have a team of course leaders uh, for this course of six of our um, uh, fellow uh, tour guides at MIA. Not all of the six of us will participate in every course session, uh, but we will rotate in and out as our schedules and the needs of the class uh, require. This fall, um, our, we have a four week long course that will be led by four of the six of us, Kay, myself, Grace, and Margot. And it will meet on Wednesdays, uh, beginning on October 11th from 2.30 to four o'clock at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Uh, we have uh, placed a cap on this course of 80 course participants, uh, and we will divide the 80 of you into four 20 member tour groups. You will stay with that tour group throughout the course, although we all meet together in the lobby at the beginning. So you'll see uh, many of your other Ollie friends there at the start. And then each week, this, these small tour groups will follow a different tour guide, each of whom has designed a unique tour that fits within our topic, the power of place. Emily, that was great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, what our topics are this year. Emily has already mentioned what we're doing in the fall, but our entire um, course, we last year we started with uh, an arc that looked at the, at the history of museums and how museums were changing. That was wildly successful. This year, we're going to do an arc that is the power of story. And we're going to start, as Emily mentioned, this fall with a power of place. Winter, we're going to go move to a little bit more intimate subject, and that's the power of relationships. And then in the spring, a good time for travel, we're going to do the power of travel, the power of journey. Next slide, please. So what will our power of place tours be about? First of all, each of them will be different. Each of us will choose our own way of looking at this. But the idea is that place itself commands a sort of distinctive space in our lives. It partly defines who we are and certainly where we feel like we belong. Place otherwise tends to have geographic boundaries like those on a map. Often 
It has spiritual, emotional, or psychological dimensions. It's environmental. It touches every aspect of our being, including our own survival. It's deeply personal, poetic, and sometimes political. And, and this is what's crucial for our tour, it allows us to explore these immense ideas that get translated by artists into visual form through art. So today, next slide, please. I'm going to be, the theme of this mini tour is the human connection to place. And I'm going to be looking at a single work and what has inspired it. And the work is Sandy Rodriguez's masterpiece that is in the Revision exhibition that is now on view at MIA through September 17th. Um, next slide, please. And here it is. Um, both Emily and I are touring this exhibition. One of the things that were a little, there are a lot of things in it that would work really well for this, this fall course. But as I mentioned, it closes September 17th. But this is an ideal time for me to present to you one of my favorite pieces. Rodriguez, the artist, calls this Mapa de los child detention centers, family separation, and other atrocities. Next slide, please. And this is, this is um, Sandy Rodriguez. She's an artist who comes from three generations of Mexican and Chicano painters. She calls herself a tilacuilo, and that's a Nahua name that is given to indigenous painters, scholars, and scribes through the colonial period. She's adopted it for herself. For 20 years, Rodriguez was a museum specialist. 15 of those years were spent at the prestigious Getty um, Museum in Los Angeles. And while she was there, she studied and taught about the methods, this is really interesting, about the methods and materials, mainly of European art. She's a Chicano painter, but what She's gained this expertise in European painting from medieval times to the 19th century. But five years ago, she left the Getty to concentrate on her work full-time as an artist. Next, next slide, please. For her, place is absolutely central in, his, in her work. And you get a taste of it. This is a, a little excerpt from that major map of piece that I'm talking about. And she says, every time you look at a plant in my work, you know that I spent four to five days there listening to bird sounds, smelling the desert, touching the plants. It's a very physical engagement. So she does, I've alluded to this, she, she does field studies camping in the desert areas along the US-Mexico border. And this is an area she knows very, very well. Her family has been moving back and forth across that border since the Mexican Revolution. In her paintings, she has a very layered approach to her art. In her paintings, she blends history, geology, botany and ancient texts to show the struggle of indigenous people to find a place for themselves and their children in this world. The single most astonishing research that Rodriguez uses is the 500 year old Florentine Codex, which is now held in the Medici Library in Florence, Italy. That's where it gets its present name. Next slide, please. Um, this codex was created shortly after the Spanish arrived to dominate it in Mexico. It was created by a Franciscan friar by the name of Bernardito de Sagún and 22 indigenous scribes from the Nahua people. The Nahua is what the Aztec people called themselves, and I'll be using that term throughout. The illustrated manuscript that Sagun and his protégés produced describes Aztec gods, rituals, calendars, omens, social life, culture, the natural world, and the use of plants. It also describes the utter brutality of the Spanish conquest, but it does so from an indigenous point of view. The resulting codex has been called the most important authoritative and complete description of Mesoamerica, that, that area where the Aztecs were centered before the Spanish arrived. 
It took 30 years for that codex to, to be compiled, compiled and the artists and scholars finishing it, finished it around uh, 1576 to 77, the very moment that New Spain was ravaged by an epidemic that wiped out 80 to 90% of the Nahua people. So the task of these artist scholars was absolutely heroic. Um, were they gonna be able to complete this record of their people before they and their entire culture would be erased by the Spanish invasion? They finished the manuscript. There, were, there are 12 books. It includes 2000 pages of text in two languages, uh, Nahuatl and Spanish, and includes 2,500 images in natural color. Now, the, the colors and the processes that were in book 11 is their natural history. And this, to get back to that piece that I'm focusing on by Sandy Rodriguez, gives rudimentary recipes for their colors made from plants and feathers and mushrooms and bugs and ochre and other, art ele uh, other earth elements. Those are the colors that Rodriguez is now recreating in her studio. Next slide, please. Through her research and discoveries that are, have been made by a lot of other who, scholars who are studying the codex, she's been learning the secret language of the, of the um, Nawa painters in their pictures. She realized that if she uses these ancient colors, that she could add hidden meaning to the context of her maps and paintings. Next slide, please. So she collects those on her field trips. Next slide. She, um, she, makes, she takes with him her Amate paper, and this depicts the rituals that the Spanish considered idolatrous. They, when the um, conquistadores arrived, they burned all the codices that they could and outlawed production of this. They wanted to erase this entire culture. I'm now gonna give you a, just a few indications of how Sandy Rodriguez is using this. Next slide, please. She incorporates you, you remember that this is all about the detention centers that were put up in 2018, through which 5,000 families were separated, parents and children. And here she's showing, showing us the detention camps and the children sleeping on cots with mylar covers, what they called emergency blankets. Next slide, please. Here we see some of the images that Rodriguez is bringing forward from the Florentine Codex, from what we call their visual language. And we're gonna see those cropping up in some of the next slides. Next slide, please. So we see her on the, on the right here, this is directly from the Codex. And she's studied this, she has a copy of it. And she's got a family that was enslaved uh, 500 years ago, and she's put them in this map that she's created. And you can see I've marked where they are. Next slide, please. But she divides them and she divides them in the same way that the government divided these families. And if you'll notice on that right-hand side, the father with the young son who's on one side of the border is in a very, very faint, um, sense. And the reason Rodriguez did that is that she was basing that on stories in the paper that young fathers were committing suicide out of their, their sadness and their sense that they would never be reunited with their families. Next slide, please. Um, she used color symbolism from the codex. Uh, the Nahua artists used opaque iron oxide colors to de denote death and the underworld. And you see that reddish pigment She's used it along the border between Mexico and Texas that separated mothers from their children. Next slide, please. And here you see her using weeping mothers from the codex and in, in her um, piece. Next slide, please. Um, she, like the Nawa painters, she uses precious Maya blue and Maya green 
to depict precious things like sacred waters and sleeping children. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's astonishing about Rodriguez is that she uses beauty knowing that we are drawn to things like this and that we will come up, we will look at those luscious colors, we will look at those subtle images and we will wanna know what's going on. So she uses our aesthetic sense to pull us into a piece we're gonna to wanna to know more about and in, including difficult issues that we otherwise might not wanna deal with. Next slide, please. So here are some of the questions that my colleagues and I might be raising this fall. How do our own connections to place draw us to any work of art? How can an image or a symbol cause us to see with new eyes? And what places, to make this personal, what places have inspired you or caused you to think or act differently? Final slide. And here is just a reminder of that work of art that we're thinking about. Now I turn it over to my colleague, Emily Shapiro. Thank you, Kay, that was great. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Kay, uh, if you could go back one slide, please. Thank you. Um, Kay, uh, focusing on the power of place through human connections, uh, her tour this fall will focus on that topic. I instead, I'm going to uh, focus on the art of Africa and the African diaspora and explore the power of place through works of art uh, from those uh, areas and cultures. I'll be looking at uh, or presenting to you uh, two artworks today as examples. Uh, one is an ancient Egyptian model boat uh, from the 22nd to the 18th century BCE. Uh, very ancient, uh, that is on view currently at MIA. And secondly, uh, a painting by the African-American artist, Clementine Hunter, uh, from the mid 20th century called The Wash. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, my fall tour will focus on works from these areas and cultures, and we'll explore the many meanings of place uh, in these works. Next, next slide. So here is an image of the ancient Egyptian model boat and figures uh, uh, as it appears actually on the MIA website. Uh, there's a slightly different uh, background to it, which you'll see in a moment in the museum currently. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the, the boat is filled with a uh, number of oarsmen uh, who are piloting the boat, presumably, uh, down the Nile River. You can see in the middle um, or the, at the front a mast uh, uh, for uh, a sail uh, and an oar to help propel the boat down the Nile. And I've given you the dimensions of this uh, model boat uh, in order to emphasize its size. It is uh, a little bit over three feet long. Uh, and 27 inches high as measured um, on its most highest um, vertical. So it's an impressive uh, uh, work. It's also made of wood, which is astonishing uh, given how long uh, it's uh, been preserved. Presumably it was buried for many of those centuries in a tomb that helped to preserve uh, it from deterioration, uh, but we will not know. So what, what is the purpose of this model boat and how does it relate to the theme of the power of place? Well, uh, on one level, it faithfully represents an actual boat that would be used for transportation purposes uh, up and down the Nile River. Um, but in this case, the model boat uh, would be used uh, in burial rituals to enable the deceased person to make a pilgrimage by proxy really to the city of Abydos, the cult center of the god Osiris, who is the god um, of the underworld and the judge of the dead. Now, Egypt, Egyptian funerary practices revolved around Osiris, 
uh, because the dead were thought to undergo a final judgment over which he presided. And uh, once passing that would achieve immortality in the afterlife. So making the symbolic journey allows the not only the body of the deceased person to arrive into the afterworld, the afterlife, but also its spirit, known as its ka, to uh, travel there as well and reunite with the body uh, for immortality. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Here I've given you a couple of close ups of the figures on this boat. Uh, and you can see how each one of them would have perhaps held an oar uh, to pilot the boat down the Nile. Um, next slide, please. And here is another detail that shows how individualized the faces of these oarsmen uh, were. It's incredible to think uh, that this has uh, survived in this uh, level of detail. Notice that they're wearing uh, white uh, robes uh, around their waist. Uh, white is the color of mourning and death in uh, this culture and uh, appropriate for this purpose. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, place here has a spiritual uh, uh, connection and meaning. Uh, it also, of course, has a geographical one. And I've given you a couple of images uh, of the Nile River and its delta as seen on the left from space. Uh, and um, on the right, you can see uh, the position of Egypt in the continent of Africa uh, and the Nile River, which spans its entire length and uh, uh, has its headwaters uh, much further south. The Nile River was, of course, a very, very important source of fertility, of agriculture. Uh, its annual flooding uh, presented uh, the opportunity for it to be linked as a symbol of, of life and death and renewal within that culture. So it, it makes sense, doesn't it, that the Nile would be used for this voyage of the deceased into the afterlife. Um, next slide, please. I'm giving you a couple of examples of wooden um, boats, Egyptian boats from um, uh, that are located in other museums. Uh, currently, this image is from the British Museum uh, from the same um, period of time as Mia's um, artwork is. And here um, you can see that the body of the deceased in its uh, cartonage, uh, presumably mummified, uh, is on a bier in the middle of the boat. And um, it would, this model is mimicking the actual voyage, perhaps, of the mummy to its eventual resting place within a tomb or pyramid. Next slide, please. And here is an example of uh, a, a similar ancient boat uh, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. Um, here you can see all the oarsmen with their oars and the person seated at the opening of that structure towards the end is the deceased person uh, himself. This was a, um, a man who was a scribe uh, or excuse me, a uh, chief steward to kings of the 11th and 12th dynasties. His name was Maketer. And he is seated smelling a blue lotus blossom, which is a symbol of uh, immortality and rebirth. Next slide, please. So a couple of questions, a little bit of further food for thought. Uh, think about what role context plays in viewing uh, artworks like these. Um, what is unique to the culture versus what is uh, universal? Uh, application. These are some of the conversations we would be having in the museum with one another. And uh, secondly, what issues, if any, are raised in your minds about the fact that these model Egyptian boats are located in museums far away from their original culture? Um, museums these days are dealing with the many ethical uh, and um, social questions that are raised by removing 
pieces from their original context and placing them elsewhere. And uh, we'll have conversations like that at the museum as well. Next slide, please. Here is a picture of Clementine Hunter, uh, the artist of my second work. She um, is pictured here um, close to the end of her life. She lived till the age of 101, as you can see on the slide. Uh, she was born just 20 years after the end of the Civil War. Her parents, excuse me, her grandparents were enslaved uh, people uh, in the south of our country. And uh, she worked for many, many decades on a Louisiana plantation uh, that was known as Melrose Plantation. Now she did not pick up a, a brush and start painting until she was well into her 50s. Uh, but she uh, took off like uh, crazy after that, and she painted hundreds and hundreds of paintings that originally uh, sold for less than a dollar and now are in the collection of many, many museums in our country. She's often called the Black Grandma Moses for the simplicity of her work uh, and um, the uh, folk art style in which she painted. Uh, next slide, please. And here is uh, one of the works by Clementine Hunter that is in our collection at MIA. It is called The Wash. And as you can see, it depicts uh, three women. Um, we don't know if they are enslaved or um, if this is after the Civil War and they are free, but they, in either case, they are doing the wash on the plantation, uh, boiling it in the cauldron, uh, rinsing it in the soap and hanging it on the line. Uh, next slide, please. And here you have a detail of the structure in the background. Uh, this is a house called African House on the Melrose Plantation. Uh, it was used uh, as originally as a storage facility there, uh, but it later became a place for um, artists to um, come to Melrose Plantation and work there in residence. It became an art colony, uh, the plantation did. Um, William Faulkner uh, worked there for a while. Richard Abaddon, the famous photographer, did as well. And uh, Melrose Plantation is now a National Historic Landmark administered by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, here is a picture, a photograph of African House on Melrose. And as you can see, uh, Hunter has fairly um, realistically depicted it in her painting, The Wash, uh, as you can see on the right. Uh, she um, uh, was very connected to Melrose Plantation. She, many of the uh, paintings that she painted were of scenes there. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, uh, you will see uh, the inside of African House, which is surrounded on all four sides by murals that she painted uh, for display there with different scenes uh, from the plantation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here are a couple of uh, more images by uh, this artist. Uh, the one on the left is uh, from the mural series in African House. And I include it here because of its unique perspective uh, on the plantation itself. We're looking down from a bird's eye view and looking at different scenes at once. Um, we can see how uh, Melrose Plantation was an emotional center for Hunter. Uh, it was a place of memory for her. It was a place where she was linked to her ancestors. And many of these scenes are ones that she chose to paint. Uh, another example of wash day on the right that is now in the collection at, of the newly opened Museum of African American History in Charleston, South Carolina. And we can see how the the place, the plantation, was a place of community as well for Hunter. Uh, next slide. So a couple of closing questions. Um, besides the Melrose, Melrose Plantation, um, think about what other places might be included in or suggested by Hunter's paintings. And what types of power are conferred through and by these places? And of course, 
we can always uh, connect back to our own lives and think about the power of place there. Think about the past and present places that define who you are and where you belong. Next slide. So uh, in closing, uh, we hope that you will join us this fall uh, to explore the power of place at MIA. Uh, we will have uh, many more uh, conversations there, not so much us lecturing from us, but uh, interactive conversations with you uh, on this topic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kay and Emily. And we are so excited to um, welcome our third speaker, Emily Schoenbeck, who's also our Ali Scholar. Emily, join us. Hello. Hi, um, I'll share my screen with you in just a moment. All right, my name is Emily Schoenbeck and I'm representing for the Ali Scholars, those of us who are still working on our doctorate degrees. Uh, today, I will be talking to you about Romeo and Juliet. Um, in particular about the family versus romantic dynamic in Romeo and Juliet um, is particularly clarified in the balcony scene. Um, first, a quick recap on Romeo and Juliet, for those of you who might not remember how it goes. It is the story of two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life whose misadventures piteous overthrows, doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but for their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. This is the prologue to Romeo and Juliet, which off the back kind of tells you what's going to happen in the story. Um, and Romeo and Juliet, we often think it's a great um, romantic, tragic story. And a lot of the questions around the play scholarship is what exactly drives the tragedy? Um, is their death at the end of the play inevitable? Um, could it have been prevented? And I want to talk through the idea today that because of the family dynamics and the tensions, um, both in the play and those in Renaissance England, um, we're seeing an expression of concern about who should be deciding who children get to marry. And we get that even from the prologue where a lot of the um, ways the lovers are referred to, they're only referred to as lovers in themselves once in the star-crossed lovers line. Um, in every other line, they're referred to by their relationship to their families. It's their death buries their parents' strife. Um, the continuance of their parents' rage and, their, and even in that last line, they, their children's end. They are always cemented in their identities in the recap of the story in the prologue um, by their relation to their families. And that's going to become very important when they recognize each other in the balcony scene as members of each other of enemy households and try to negotiate love from that place. So we're going to talk a little bit first about where does this story come from? Uh, the source for Romeo and Juliet is, has two sources. The original is The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet by Matteo Spandello, circa roughly 1500s. He is an Italian novelist who wrote actually dozens of very popular novels. He's a very famous Italian writer, and he usually wrote kind of dramatizations of real life events. Romeo and Juliet is very loosely based on an actual um, historic family feud. Juliet was a real historical person. In fact, if you go to Verona, Italy, you can visit Juliet's house. Um, very different from the actual person as presented in the play, but it is a fun sort of historical marker. Um, Shakespeare presumably knew the story through Arthur Brooke, who in 1562 translated the story into English for the first time. Um, it is worth noting, um, translation at this point was considered its own creative process. Um, there wasn't this strong compulsion that like, oh, I need to translate the author's story as they wrote it. Um, you could take a story and in translating it, alter the story to fit more in line with your own tastes or what you thought your audience tastes would be, which is something Arthur Brooke did. Um, he varies several different details about the story in his translation. Um, this is presumably where Shakespeare got it from, though we do know there was at least one other version in French that Shakespeare maybe also had some exposure to. Um, and this becomes relevant because this tells us like we have a track record of what the story was like and what alterations Shakespeare opted to make himself. Um, 
the most famous um, probably change over is in his tone towards the lovers. Arthur Brooks' uh, version of Romeo and Juliet begins with the following preface. To this end, good reader, is this the tragical matter written to describe unto thee a couple of unfortunate lovers thralling themselves to unhonest desire, neglecting the authority and advice of parents and friends, conferring their principal counsels with drunken gossips and superstitious friars, the naturally fit instruments of unchastity, attempting all adventures of peril for the attaining of their wished lust, using ocular confession, the key of whoredom and treason for furtherance of their purpose, abusing the honorable name of lawful marriage to cloak the shame of stolen contracts. Finally, by all means of on honest life, hasting to most unhappy death. The point of Brooke's story is a cautionary tale about what happens when children are allowed to impulsively pursue their own passions, and in this case, particularly labeling it lust. Um, that is, for those of you familiar with the play, not quite Shakespeare's take on the story. And this partly reflects a growing tension in the Renaissance over the nature of marriage. Um, marriage in the Renaissance coming out of the medieval period had largely been negotiated by families, what we would call arranged marriages, um, in which case the happiness of all parties was still important, um, but it, it was thought that decision was best left to the parents, the more mature people who would oversee the interests of their children. Um, children, um, the young people's um, preferences were certainly taken into account even in these scenarios, but they weren't the final word in an arranged marriage. Um, Shakespeare's time in the late 1500s saw a rise in what we call companionate marriages, uh, marriages um, struck between two people who wish to get married for their own companionship. Um, love marriages is sometimes what we also refer to them as. Um, and there was this growing tension during this time over who should get to choose who young people marry. Um, this is particularly contested in wealthier families. Um, the poor generally or lower class had a little bit more freedom in who they married simply because there was less property and less political power up for grabs in a marriage. Um, so with less at stake, young people were thought to be able to govern it for themselves. And of course, at the highest levels of stake where you had actual royalty, kings, queens, princes, and dukes, um, those were of course arranged marriages. There was way too much political power um, involved in those to let people marry like whom they would when they would. Um, so between those two kind of spectrums, though, you had this debate um, amongst the middle and lower classes, who should, who is the most prudent person to pick who people marry? Um, it's something interesting to note um, in the Renaissance, um, we have sort of a false misconception about how old people were when they got married. Um, usually when I roughly kind of pull people, they're like, oh, yeah, they were married at uh, 14, 16, you know, maybe 18. Um, the average age in the Renaissance um, for, for marriage um, for middle to lower class people was 24 for women and roughly 27 for men. Um, usually you didn't get married if you were in a working class position until after you had completed your various trade um, training, whether that was as an apprentice or you were working as a cook or maid in another household if you were a woman. Um, you had to essentially make enough money and get enough training that when you got married, you would be able to support and contribute to your family. Um, not all that different from maybe how we think of marriage today, where, you know, if you have college not college educated um, workers who aren't going to get married until, you know, they've graduated, gotten their first job, and okay, now I can think about, you know, marriage, kids, a house. Um, so there's sort of a parallel to how we think of it in modern times. Um, for upper uh, class, not royalty, but upper uh, middle class to gentry and lower aristocracy, even then the marrying age only dropped to about 20 for women. So while it's still fairly young by modern standards, there it wasn't a common practice to be marrying off children. Um, as relevant to Romeo and Juliet, um, even in Italy where they married some of the youngest, it was about 19 was the average age for a young noble woman in Italy to be getting married. Um, so certainly like well past like finishing puberty and moving into a, even now today we would consider adulthood if early adulthood. Um, so because of this, um, you had people, because they were older than we oftentimes conceive of them as think of them as being 
they had more say like you a 24 year old is going to express much more preference and be thought much more capable than a 14 year old in making a decision um so that's where this partly tension arose from you had people who were effectively adults thinking or not even effectively by 20 mid 20s and fully employed they were adults thinking i should be able to decide who i marry and parents wanting to have uh, that more traditional say in who they ought to marry um, this is also particularly important for women who had a growing amount of agency and rights within marriage, but were still largely considered property would probably be a little bit of a harsh term, but they were considered the same legal entity as their husbands. You were a member of your father's household in the law, and then when you got married, you became legally the same person as your husband. A married woman could not be sued independently. Um, you could sue her husband if you wanted to sue her. If she wanted to enter into a contract, her husband could enter into a contract on her behalf. So that's where a lot of the legal tension around marriage for women came. It was that you were part of your husband when you got married. That sort of Christian idea of the two fleshes becoming one flesh was how the law viewed it. Um, so women in particular are very keen to either have a say in who they're going to marry since they're going to give up so much of their legal rights when they get married. Um, so we see that arise in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, where we have two young people who um, want to form a companionate marriage, and their households definitely do not want that to happen because we are told they are warring households. Um, one of the things that's interesting to note in the original um, poem, uh, novel, Italian novel, Juliet is about 18. Um, Arthur Brooks, when he translates this to English, drops her age to 16, and Shakespeare drops her age to 13 in the play. She is 13, will be 14 in about two weeks. Uh, we actually know roughly when Juliet's birthday is. It's the very end of July, um, and then events of Romeo and Juliet take place mid-July in the heat of July, which is frequently referenced throughout the play, like why tensions are so high. It's because it's hot and everybody's angry. Um, but this young age for Juliet um, kind of drives home this point of how much control should a young person have over their own heart and their own destiny? Like intensified in her case because she's even so, she's even a decade younger than most people would be when they are getting married, and people are already her father and has a suitor that's coming to call on her already. Um, but we get when she gets her own choice in the matter in the balcony scene. Um, we get this following passage after she has met Romeo and she is now kind of musing on him. Oh Romeo, Romeo. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Romeo in the garden, shall I hear more or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is not, nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, no, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doth thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. So we get sort of Juliet making the case for the companionate marriage here. Um, in her opening line, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore out the Romeo? Um, a lot of people in modern translation assume she's asking, where are you, Romeo? Um, but wherefore um, was actually a way in Elizabethan England of saying, why? She's saying, Romeo, Romeo, why are you Romeo? Like of all the people you had to be, why did that have to be your name? And she's musing on the fact that that name, the thing that, you know, is enemy to me isn't actually your person, it's your family. And here's the big thesis for her. You are not your family. You are an individual who can want and love and be loved apart from your family. The argument for the companionate marriage, you don't have to do as your family says, because you are not your family. And to a modern ear that might sound kind of like a, well, of course I am not my family, I am my own individual. But for a Renaissance coming out of the recently Middle Ages, 
that was a big deal. Your family was your main unit of identity. You, you depended on each other for survival, um, to the idea that you weren't a part of your family or that you could just detach yourself from your family was a very big idea. Um, and we get Romeo's response in the next few lines. He comes forth, I take thee at thy word. Call me but love and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth, I will never be Romeo. And we get the, get the comedic moment of Juliet asks, what manner thou that the screened in night so stumblest on my counsel? And Romeo, by a name, I know not how to tell thee who I am. Because she's just told him to get rid of his name. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word. Um, so this is his response that he is willing to take her up on her proposition. The idea that you're right. We are individuals. I am not my name. I am not my family. Of course, this is kind of one of the high romantic moments of the play. Um, the tragedy of the story comes from their inability to doth their names, their attempt to form a companionate marriage, their attempt to be their own individual people, um, separated from their family, does not work. And you almost get that kind of comedically expressed here where he's like, yeah, I'll get rid of my name. And then she's like, who are you? And he's like, well, now I don't have anything to call myself. There's, you're bound up in your name and by extension, your family more than you maybe like to think you are. This tension has led critics to describe Romeo and Juliet as a play about a conflict um, between manhood as violence on behalf of the father and manhood as separation from the father and sexual union with woman. Do you become a man by fighting your father's fight, duking it out in the streets of Verona? Um, or do you become a man when you get married and form a loving attachment with a woman? Like, where does that transition come from? And this tension of families expresses itself for both genders as Harley Granville described, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy of youth as youth sees it. Romeo and Juliet do not decide to be in the conflict that they are in. They, uh, Juliet is 13, Romeo is maybe 16. They are not old enough to have really had much history even in the conflict. And yet their family connection, this greater force than they can contradict, as the play refers to it, is going to determine the course, not only of their loves, but of their lives and ultimately their death. So thank you for taking this brief tour of me through this key scene in Romeo and Juliet. Um, this is something of how I teach my courses, and I'm excited for my upcoming course where we'll be talking about everyone but Shakespeare and hitting some of the Renaissance plays that weren't penned by the famous bard, but are still pretty good. Thank you. Emily, thank you. That was terrific. And I also want to thank all of our speakers today who gave us a taste of what Ali is about. Um, I also want to thank our staff who behind the scenes have made this possible. And of course, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. I just want to mention that now is the perfect time to join Ali. Um, we're offering 82 fascinating classes this fall, and I guarantee you there will be something that's going to spark your interest. We also have both in-person and online courses. Um, we do that every term so people can join remotely if that's more convenient or if they're traveling during holidays or during the winter. So just know that we keep both of our curricula very vibrant and rich in many choices. Our course request period is open right now and runs through August 28th. And if you'd like to learn more or start or renew a membership, you can download, download our course guide. Here's what it looks like. Um, it's on our website. You can download an electronic version. Um, our website is Ali, O L L I, dot U M N, dot E D U. And I do want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of joining. I know that we've had in the um, question and answer questions about the, uh, the cost and just what you get for that. Our membership fee is $300. That's an all-inclusive membership fee. For that amount, you're able to take as many courses as you want to take, uh, enroll in as many courses as you want. Um, you can participate in our special interest groups, our book clubs, our events. So it's a lot of value for that money. And I also really wanna stress, we have scholarships available. So if that is a stretch for you, don't let that um, stand in the way of joining. Um, we're very supportive of people joining and we will um, work on a scholarship with you. 
Um, a couple of important things to keep in mind too. Um, we do, because you know you have an all-inclusive membership when you join, you can request as many courses as you want, but we do have some of our courses that fill up. Some courses are very small, like some of our tours, maybe 15 to 20 people, and we often do see a lot of interest in them. So we do an allocation process where you tell us your first choice, your second choice, your third choice with things you're requesting. And we try to get people into their first choice for sure. Um, oftentimes people are getting into all of their choices. Um, people get about 91% of the courses they request, but we do have a process because we know that some of, especially those smaller courses, um, there's a lot of interest in them, and we do try to offer them over numerous terms. So if you don't get in, there's usually a good opportunity to get in um, in the next term. And our fall courses start on Monday, October 2nd, so there's still time to look around and um, get excited about joining. Um, I don't know if we have any more um, questions here. Um, Carmi, is there anything that, that came up that you think we should address in the question answers? I think that we've answered all of them, Kate. Okay, terrific. Well, please know that we're here. Um, reach out to us if you have questions. Visit our website. Um, you know, you can email us at Oli, O L L I at umn.edu and we'll respond. And this concludes our program today. So thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you this fall. And we have recorded this, so we will be sending you a link if you want to review it or share it with others in your network. So thank you so much for being here today um, and enjoy the rest of your summer and we hope to see you this fall. Thank you.